Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. If you are new here or have been here and haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help push this video into the algorithm and helps the channel, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Creepy Encounters. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. This happened literally five minutes ago, as I'm writing this. I live about a 10-15 to 15 minute walk away from the beach, and I made a point to walk to the beach more since it's been so hot lately. Anyway, I was with my sister, and we had just come from the beach. We passed this weird-looking guy. He has scruffy hair, was wearing no shirt, and giving me weird vibes. My dog, a very large German Shepherd, mind you, started going crazy, barking and growling, and I had to get my sister to help hold my dog back. He said to me, there's a big fucking snake in the bush over there, and pointed to it. I sort of nodded, and we kept walking. He walked in the direction of the beach, and we kept going on our way. But we started going a fair bit faster, because that guy was creepy as hell. We made it to this point where we have to wait a couple of minutes to cross the road because of the cars, and that guy, kid you fucking not, comes out of the bushes, like fucking emerges from nowhere. That means that he must have seen us, pretended to walk away, and then immediately cut across the bushes and started following us. We then started walking home, and he kept following us, sticking a few meters to the left. I said in a loud voice, I think that weird guy's following us, and he immediately turns around, walks up to this path that he already passed, and goes up it. We were pretty sure he was still watching us, so we made a plan to go a different direction as to not let him know where we live. We did a few circles for a bit and then went to our house and told our parents what had happened. I was on vacation in San Antonio with a friend for New Year's. In retrospect, I would have picked anywhere else to celebrate, but I had never been to San Antonio before, so I thought it would be cool. When we pull up to the place, it's very obvious it's not a great neighborhood, but it was extremely cheap and within walking distance to the river walk. I'm no stranger to questionable neighborhoods, so I wasn't too concerned about the area, as it was very quiet. On the day of New Year's Eve, my friend got food poisoning and asked me to go get some stuff from the gas station down the road. I wasn't comfortable taking their truck, and since it was only an eight-minute walk, I started heading out. I got to the gas station no problem, but they didn't have any Pedialyte, so I started walking to another gas station only five minutes away. This is where it gets sketchy. I'm halfway to the gas station, and I notice there's two homeless guys walking around outside their tent next to the street I'm on. Originally, I was going to walk right past them and pay them no mind, but when I got closer, I could tell that they noticed me and were staring at me hard. I'm 5'5", not super athletic, pretty strong, but... I'm not taking any chances with two grown men. Instead of going straight past them, I turned the corner. I assumed they would go about their business and leave me alone. I hear one of them say, Hey, Randy, come over here. And I glance behind me and see three men now following me. 
They're far enough away where I'm not worried, but extremely cautious. I glance behind me again after a few minutes. They're hunched over, huddled up like they're trying to sneak up on me. Much closer this time. I make the smart decision to say fuck the Pedialyte and round the corner back towards our house. I'm maybe one to two blocks away when I check behind me again, and they have also rounded the corner and were walking very quickly. I started booking it, and I hear the three men behind me yelling at me. I didn't look back this time, but I could hear shuffling feet breaking into a run. Thankfully, I made it inside before they could see where I went to. I peeked out of the peephole in the door and watched in horror as these three men came barreling around the corner and frantically looking around for me. They're arguing and pointing around, but eventually they fuck off. If I wasn't so alert, I shudder to think what would have happened. And no, I did not get the Pedialyte. Instead, I had to get it delivered. Hey everyone, I'm a 23-year-old female, and while I do have to dodge the occasional creep, it's moments like this that make me question whether or not humanity has any hope and debate if anyone can actually be trusted. So, for context of this story, I'm 4'11 or 5 foot. I miss the tall gene that my family has. I'm petite, but trust me, all of the height translates well into fury. I go running at the track not far from where I live, not even really for the intent of exercising. It's more like my decompression, stop to daydream and run off the day's frustrations. I did about a mile and had a seat on a bench to catch my breath, look for another playlist on my iPod and debate if I was going to do any further running. A man came and had a seat next to me. He was extremely large both in stature and body weight. Somewhere in the ballpark of maybe six foot four, he could have easily squashed me like a bug. I didn't pay him much mind, or at least I tried not to. It was especially hard given the ample amount of park benches around the track that were unoccupied. He said something, but I could barely hear him with my AirPods in. I took them out and asked him to repeat himself. He said, I said they don't make them the way they were when I was your age. I was confused, but not really confused. He went on to say things like, bodies are changing, and if I had a girlfriend like you. After continuing to not say anything to him, he asked if my parents were okay with me being in a park alone and asked what time my curfew was. He then started rambling about my butt and my boobs, implying that I was extremely advanced for my age. Dude, I'm small, and yes, I have tits, but I'm not old enough to drink at a bar. I'm financing a car, I vote, I pay rent, but still very creepy. I got up to leave, and he stood up after me, he asked if he could take me out for food, but I ignored him and kept walking. I went near the bathroom where they have a set of wall lockers and got my things. I also made a pit stop in the bathroom for obvious reasons. When I left, I started making my way to my car, but he was on the sidewalk, not far away from my vehicle. I made the long loop around so that I wouldn't have to pass near him. As I'm about to get in my car, he calls out to me and says, Oh, so you can drive. I don't know if that was disappointment to figure out that I was older than he thought, or whatever. I didn't stop. I got in the car and left. He made a motion for me to stop, but I didn't. I also had my hand on my revolver. Don't think it was that extreme of a case, but screw it. I'd rather ask for forgiveness. The reason I'm typing this narrative out in the first place is because I got a card in the mail and, surprise, there's a registered sex offender in my neighborhood that commuted crude acts towards a minor. 
And guess whose black and white picture was in the corner? I filed a police report this afternoon. I told them he was at a public park and possibly thought I was a minor. They said they'd look into it, but judging by how they took my report, I hold out little hope. Be careful out there, everyone. I don't care what age you are. Some people are just downright dangerous. This happened back when I was 22. A girl I dated since high school sporadically left me for another guy. On an impulse, I decided to travel across country to California to do some surfing. I didn't make any formal plans, and I'd say that it was fairly spur-of-the-moment decision. Not important, but it would demonstrate some of my lack of preparation. I slept in my car for the most part at Crackle Barrels, if I could find one. I wasn't in a huge hurry to get to my destination. I was just happy to be out of the city and on the open road. I made detours here and there, and also got rerouted a few times for one reason or another. I decided to save on some costs by spending the night at a campground one night. It was a comfortable enough setup, and I was planning on sleeping on the beach when I hit California. So I had my trunk full with some camping gear. My goal was to relax for the night and hit the road in the early morning. I set up camp and was beginning to settle down for the night. I cracked open a beer and lit a cigar. Suddenly, this girl approaches my slot and asks if she could join me. She was pretty, dirty blonde hair and pretty busty. Honestly, everything you would potentially want in this kind of situation. I knew this wasn't going to end the way that my head was leaning towards because she called out to the tree line and told some people that I said it was okay to join. Two guys came out, both about my height, but something was a bit off about them. I rationalized this as just being a part of the circumstances. Three strangers at a campsite with me, just not knowing who they were, seems as though it was reasonable to me to be a little perturbed. I had a Yeti full of beer, which I shared. They played some music and we talked for a bit. They weren't horrible company, and from what I gathered, it seemed like they may have just wanted to split my beer and some food. As the sun went down, the topics of conversation, as well as their behavior, got a little troubling for my taste. One of the guys just unzipped their pants and took a piss right near the fire, where everybody was sitting. It didn't bother them, but I found it odd. Next, one of the guys just casually pulled out a belt knife and began sharpening it. He asked me some really specific questions such as if my parents were funding my trip and if I was carrying a gun. At my current age, I wouldn't have offered any information and would have probably made an excuse to leave. But younger me said no to both questions, which was a lie, because I carried and still carry a 357 Magnum under my seat. The other guy asked me how much pocket money I'd have to have on myself to travel solo across the country. I told him that I was budget traveling and didn't carry cash on me. I got the impression more and more that these people didn't have pleasantries on the brain and that I may be in a worse situation than I had originally thought. The part of me that viewed myself as Kerouac and thought that I was just meeting some colorful travelers such as myself quickly realized that reality isn't quite as romantic. The girl, who was originally sweet and somewhat shy, became more aggressive as the night went on. Not like in a super intimidating or scary way, but she became more vocal and more physical with the other two not the same girl that approached my camp. One of the bigger guys came over and had a seat near me, but dangerously close. I was leaning up against a log bench, and he kept his arm around me, but not touching me. 
The guy with the knife asked me more questions, such as who knew I was traveling, when I was expected back home, and what I did for a living. The questions were too specific for me to rationalize as casual conversation. I became extremely scared because it dawned on me that my dumbass did this on an impulse. I didn't have a job that would report me missing, and my family didn't know that I was traveling. I wanted my trip to be low-key, and in that stupid thought process, anything could happen to me, and nobody would know. The guy holding the knife then started telling a story about his first time hunting. He asked me if I hunted, which I said yes. He then went into graphic detail about his first time that he and his friend went rabbit hunting, and essentially how they butchered a rabbit alive. The other two thought the story was funny. I did not. I don't know if this was a scare tactic or the preamble to something more sinister. I didn't take my chances, though. I got up to grab some more beers, one, to contemplate how I was going to leave, and two, to get myself repositioned away from the other guy. I knew I was dealing with something more serious when the guy that was sitting next to me followed me to my car, which was only a few feet away. I made several excuses to move, as I usually grabbed necessary items and put them in my trunk. It looked like they were on to what I was trying to do, so I had to think fast. I noticed the one that kept close to me was slurring his speech from drinking, so I made my last-ditch effort using that to my advantage. I grabbed four beer bottles and passed them out, as I had been doing. I took a small squirt bottle and dropped a few drops in my beer and did the same to theirs. I raised my bottle to toast, then the girl asked what I put in their drink. I told her it was just something to take the edge off and liven up the party some. One drank the beer with no problem, but the other two seemed hesitant. I insisted, but they didn't take the bait. I took a long chug myself and told them it was just THC, and it wasn't that potent. They eventually drank the beer once they saw that I was comfortable drinking it. After a couple of minutes, I started acting sick and realized I had mixed up the drops. One guy got angry and asked me what it was. I grabbed my head and told them I didn't know. Then I gave a very frantic apology by saying I had been putting it in their drinks for the past hour or so. The bigger of the two started dry heaving and eventually fell over. The guy that was originally holding the knife started getting dizzy. The girl lay down while clutching the log bench, demonstrating what looked like seasickness to me. I threw up the deuces sign and I got in my car and drove off. A couple of things worth noting here. Number one, because I still had a long trip ahead of me, I didn't want to be hung over, so we were all drinking non alcoholic beer. Number two, the drug administered was nothing more than liquid caffeine from a vape pen. Was I in danger? I'll never have closure to say yes or no, but considering the specifics of the questions, along with the sudden changes in personality, I'm leaning toward yes. I considered just turning around and going home, but I pressed on to California. I also told everyone that I could that I was traveling and which routes I was taking, and also checked in with my family once a day. And, just to end this on a positive note, I met my wife on that trip to California. This happened when I was 22. I'm now in my 30s. At the time, I was preparing applications for grad school, so after work each evening, I would go to the local university library and stay until closing, which was 11 p.m. I took the subway to my neighborhood and decided to make a quick stop at the nearby 24-hour grocery store to get some things for a late-night dinner. I bought my items and was back outside waiting at the crosswalk for the light to change, 
so I could cross the street. There were at least two other people waiting at that crosswalk as well. I lived in a major metropolis, and so there was almost always other people around at whatever time of the night or day. Suddenly, a man comes running from out of nowhere, it seemed, and stood right next to me, now also waiting at the crosswalk. He was middle-aged, maybe five foot seven, and had a slim build. I thought that maybe he was just wanting to make sure he could make the light and not miss the chance to cross. However, as we were crossing the street, I noticed that he starts to make some odd movements with his legs. I don't really know how to describe it, other than to say he was kind of tripping himself up and drastically slowing down so that he went from walking in front of me to suddenly being directly behind me. To be honest, my first thought at the time was racism. I have a very petite and feminine build, looked very young, and was clutching library books in my arms, but I'm also a black woman. I truly thought that he was scared to have me walk behind him. It never entered my mind that I might be the one in danger. I simply noted his behavior, laughed it off, and then forgot about him. On my way home, I passed a small convenience store that I frequented for inexpensive fresh produce that was also open 24 hours. I decided to make a quick stop and get a few more items for dinner. I was in the store for maybe five minutes and had truly forgotten about that man from the crosswalk. Except, when I exited the store, he was standing right outside. I was so startled. It looked like he had been waiting for me. My heart started to pound through my chest, and I was going into survival mode. As soon as I passed him and continued walking home, he started walking, following right behind me. I could hear his steps and sense him nearby. I needed to make sure that he was really following me so that I could plan my next move. I could see the entrance to the subway just right ahead of me, I decided I would duck into the subway station to see if he followed me in, but, more importantly, to ask for help from the ticket collector. Unfortunately, when I went into the station, the ticket collector was not in the booth. The station was completely empty. No commuters, either. I spontaneously decided to hide against the wall to the left, where I could not be seen from the street entrance. Thirty seconds later, the man walked into the station, so nonchalantly. He was almost skipping, as he headed right to the turnstile, as if it was his plan all along to take the train. However, at the last minute, he looked behind himself and saw me standing there against the wall. As soon as he saw me, he stopped, turned completely around, and walked out of the station, no longer intending to go down into the subway. I knew I was undeniably in danger. I took out my phone and called my roommate, we'll call him Tim, praying he was home and would pick up. He did. I explained in a panic what was happening. Are you home? Can you come get me? I asked. Tim asked me if the man was still there. I carefully peeked around the wall to look out to the street. There stood the man. He was standing, smoking, and laughing with some guys. He was literally making friends as he waited for me outside the station. I told Tim, yes, the man is still there. A train must have arrived downstairs in the subway because, at that moment, there was suddenly a bunch of people coming through the turnstile and exiting the station. Tim and I agreed that I should leave the station in this crowd of people stay on the phone with him, and he would meet me on the street. Essentially, we would walk towards each other. Our house was only a five-minute walk away on the same street as the station. When I left the station, I had to pass the man. He saw me in the crowd. I saw him throw down his cigarette, and then from behind me, I heard him say to the men he had been talking to, I have to go. He continued to follow me. I told Tim everything, since we remained on the phone. I tried to walk as quickly as I could, 
but there was snow and ice on the sidewalk. I don't know why I didn't alert any of the other people who had exited the subway station and were now walking with me on the street. It was sort of this experience of feeling alone in a crowd, if you know what I mean. I knew the man was behind me, but too scared to look back more than once to check. It felt like an eternity, but I finally saw Tim walking towards me on the sidewalk. We were both very young, but Tim is tall, over six foot. I felt a wave of relief as he came to my side. He told me he took a knife from the kitchen to defend us just in case. Our house was right ahead. We walked quickly inside and locked the door. With the lights off, we looked out of the window for that man, but he was nowhere in sight. I've had my fair share of dealing with creeps and weirdos in my life. I just wanted to write this down to share with you. This story is about a potentially dangerous and racist pervert in Atlanta, Georgia. Some encounters are not as serious, but creepy nonetheless. A few years ago, I was living in Los Angeles, California. I lived next door to a mortuary. Tons of creepy energy from here alone. And right behind my house was a halfway house full of ex-cons, drug addicts, alcoholics, etc. The house was two stories and overlooked my backyard. They would play loud rock music early in the mornings, and some of them would sit in the windows upstairs to smoke. There was one guy in particular who smoked a lot. Almost every other hour, I would see him taking drag after drag from his cigarette, watching my backyard intently. He looked sort of young, maybe early 30s. He had greasy black hair that I guess he attempted to cut and tidy up somewhat and scabs and marks all over his colorless face. He wore black, thick rimmed glasses. He had a deranged, psychotic sort of energy, but he wasn't aggressive. It's hard to describe. I'm not one to judge anyone in his position, but the way he would always watch my house and anyone that would come outside to the backyard, it was disturbing to say the least. After a while, I would stop coming out back. He would always be up there, wild, unblinking eyes watching me as I walked around. He never spoke or made a sound. He just watched. One day, I was watching movies with my friends in the living room. The living room of that house led into the backyard. There was a window behind one of the couches that faced directly outside. We had the blinds and windows open. It was a warm night, sometime in the summer. I was sitting on the couch with the window directly behind me. I think I heard something outside. I'm not sure. But... For some reason, I turned around to look out of the window, and there he was, up inside his window, looking right at me. He was shirtless. I could see scabs all over his upper torso. His eyes were wider than normal. They had a sick, perverted look to them. There was no cigarette or smoke that I could see. His hands were down, out of view. I think he was even nodding his head a little bit. We stared at each other for a few short seconds before I abruptly closed the blinds and silently continued to watch the movie. I don't think my family noticed. I had trouble sleeping that night, knowing he was still over there. Luckily, I don't live in that neighborhood anymore. Last year, I moved to another city after finishing high school. I assessed several college options and decided on one that would have me move roughly three hours away. I found an apartment where I would be able to live without roommates, and that was in a safe part of town with reasonable rent. It was close to some attractions in the city, 
which was an added bonus to me as it would still allow me to have a reasonable social life. For the first four months or so, it was fantastic. There were absolutely no problems or safety concerns of any sort, and I managed to become good friends with a guy who studied at the same college as me. He coincidentally lived around five minutes away from me, so we would often hang out at each other's place. One night, just as winter started, he called me over to play video games and hang out. We had a pretty chill night, drank a few beers and had a few laughs and enjoyed ourselves. At around 1 a.m., we decided to call it a wrap and I headed home to my apartment. When I got back home, I decided to head out to the balcony that overlooked the entrance of my building to smoke a cigarette. I vividly remember looking around and seeing absolutely nobody. It was a cold winter night, and it wasn't the weekend, so understandably, everybody was at home. Besides the usual car or two passing by, it was dead quiet. Once I finished my cigarette, I decided to call it a night and got ready for bed. I was understandably confused when I heard a short ring on my doorbell. I stood in the corner of my room for a solid few seconds as confusion and a little bit of fear set in. I snapped out of it and decided to tiptoe to my door and to just try and hear if anyone was outside. My immediate thought was that my friend came over to drop off something that I might have forgotten, but I thought to myself that he would have texted me or called. I probably listened for half a minute or so when the person, once again, rang the doorbell and softly knocked a few times. I stood still and didn't want to make a sound so that I wouldn't give away the fact that I was at the door. I heard the stranger pacing around the apartment for a few seconds before he stopped. I waited for any sort of noise, but it was quiet. That was when I decided to peer through the peephole to see that he hopefully had left. I picked up the cover of the peephole and took a look. My legs pretty much went numb as I saw a hooded figure looking straight into the peephole. He was holding the zipper of his hoodie so as to cover his face. All I could really make out was his forehead and eyes. He must have either heard me lift the cover or my heavy breathing because right away he moved from the peephole and said, I know you're at the door. By this point, I was pretty much shivering in fear, but mustered up the courage to say, I'm calling the cops, man. He laughed and said, Sure thing, big guy. He proceeded to wipe away the door handle with a sleeve before walking off. I understandably called the police. When they came over, they informed me that I wasn't the only one. He had been doing this for at least a month, and they suspected him of at least one home invasion where a father chased him out of the house. I crashed at my friend's house for around a week or so after this before going back to my own apartment. It's been a year, and I've never heard of any news about this strange man. He could have been arrested by now, but as far as I know, he hasn't been. I find it more likely that he simply moved to a different area. I'm not sure if he had any violent intent or not, but either way, I hope I never run into him again. Hello, friends. So I came across some information about an old friend, which has left me, as the kids would say nowadays, shooketh. I figured I would share this rather insane story. But before we get started, my name is Mikey, and I'm in my 20s. Also, I'd like to apologize for how overly sarcastic this story may seem. Humor is my defense mechanism, just in case Forewarning, this story mentions murder, but I don't go into much detail. When I was an angsty teenager, I moved in with my mother and stepdad to escape a less than desirable situation. Because of the move, I was enrolled in a new school. This school was located in one of the sketchiest neighborhoods in the city. 
Everyone who resided in that area was relatively low income, my family included. We had a rec center near the school that was a hot spot for, mm, let's just call them undesirables, which was primarily teenage boys wandering over the nearby high school to catcall the girls. Lunchtime was my favorite. I loved going outside for chow and having sweaty teenage boys asking for the nasty. Note the sarcasm. Anyway, during my time at my shitty school, I made an array of friends. However, there was one person who became my best friend. Let's call her Blondie. She and I got along. Uh, what's a negative connotation? I was a people pleaser, and she would take advantage of that. Blondie was nice enough, but she was also problematic. Regardless, we were best friends and thus began our very short-lived friendship. Over the school year, she mainly came over to my house since I was an only child. We usually had the house to ourselves while my folks were still at work. However... She finally invited me to her house around the middle of the school year. I was super excited. I had always wanted to meet her family since they were always such an enigma. Blondie wasn't one to divulge information about her home life. All I knew was that she lived with her mother, stepdad, and younger sibling. I'm unsure if she was embarrassed or didn't care to share but I finally had the honor of meeting them. Honestly, her family was amazing. They were kind and treated me very well. Not to mention, her stepdad was a phenomenal cook. The best spaghetti and meatballs I've ever had. After that, I started going to her house more and more. And, you know what? I really enjoyed it. Fast forward to a month or two before the end of the school year, and it's Blondie's birthday. Her family was throwing a little get-together at their house, and I was invited. Blondie and I headed to her house after school, and it was a really fun time. Until the end of the day. Now, I knew next to nothing about her biological father. I knew he wasn't really in the picture, He'd sometimes drop by and say hello, but I had never personally met him. That was until he had made a surprise visit to give Blondie a present. When I tell you there was a shift in the atmosphere, I kid you not. I could immediately feel it, and I was a dumb kid. We were inside the living room eating some cake, and there was a knock at the front door. Blondie's mom answered, and her face, which once had a nice smile on it, turned into a scowl. If looks could kill, that dude would be dead. She moved aside, and this man walked in. I'll never forget how everyone in the room got tense except for Blondie, who excitedly greeted her dad. At the time, he seemed like a normal-ish kind of dude. Maybe a tad bit on the creepier side, but who am I to judge? Blondie introduced me to her father, and we shared some pleasantries. At one point, I was invited to go get some ice cream with him the following day, which I accepted. I mean, I was getting free ice cream. Of course I was going to say yes. He eventually left, and we all got back to eating cake. I had honestly forgotten about the visceral reaction everyone had upon seeing him. Maybe if I remembered, I would have said no. Anyway, the following day rolled around, and I went for ice cream with Blondie and her dad. I can't remember much from that day other than him asking me if I had a boyfriend or girlfriend, which seemed innocent enough, but the way he asked it made me feel very weird. I honestly can't remember much from my other encounters with this man. Nothing really jumps out to me. I know I went out with him and Blondie a few more times before my family moved to another city. We lost touch. Fast forward a few years and I'm attending college. I had managed to stay in contact with one person from my middle school days. Let's call her Teddy. 
She had reached out to me one day asking if I wanted to go to a movie, which I happily accepted. I was balls deep in the big sad at the time and needed a pick-me-up. A film with an old friend was just what I needed. I took the train to a nearby mall, and Teddy and I watched the movie. Afterwards, we headed to the food court and got some chow. We were catching up, but it had been a couple of years since we last saw each other, when Teddy suddenly perked up. She asked me if I had heard about Blondie's father, to which I said we hadn't been in contact since I moved. Teddy's face lit up, and she told me the most mind-blowing story my little brain had ever heard. She informed me Blondie's father had murdered a woman. Now, before I continue, she was going based on word of mouth while she was telling me all the details. Teddy had no news articles or police report to back her story. She was told by a friend who heard from someone else and so on. But... What she told me wasn't exactly far from the truth. According to her, Blondie's father had taken the life of a street worker. He got away with it for two years, and his truck got him caught. Apparently, there was something unique about it. Teddy couldn't tell me much more because she genuinely didn't know. I remember going back to my dorm and trying to Google for more details but I couldn't find a damn thing about it. I eventually forgot about the story until last year, 2023. I was discussing the craziest stories from my life with a friend when I suddenly remembered Teddy's story. After some digging, I finally found an article that described the crime. I clicked on it, and when I saw the picture of the man, well, words can't describe what I felt. Everything Teddy told me was true, but it was so much worse than what she and I thought. Out of respect for the victim and her family, I won't describe what he did to her, but he was arrested three years after he had taken her life. I can't find any information about how he was caught, but it had something to do with his truck. He was charged with manslaughter. He took a plea bargain and indignity to a body and only served seven years for his 14-year sentence. He had served half already because he was in custody during the trial. I looked him up not too long ago, and I learned some rather unsettling information, which prompted me to write this story. He was released from prison a few months ago. Guess what he did? Yep. He killed another woman. From what I've heard, it had similarities to the other murder he committed. This time, he's charged with second-degree murder and indignity to a body. There's, unfortunately, still not a lot of information about the second woman, but both of his victims were mothers. They both were cruelly taken from this world, and I still can't wrap my mind around this all. I met this monster. I was best friends with his daughter. I don't think I was personally in any danger, but the fact I met someone capable of such heinous crimes, it scares the living shit out of me. I can't even begin to imagine how Blondie must have felt after learning of her father's crimes. Anyway... I apologize for the length of my story and how vague I was regarding the crimes. I know some of you really want to know everything, but I didn't feel right to share their story, especially since it had little to do with me. I was just the schmuck that was friends with the daughter. Also, I would like to provide more information about how Blondie is, but I can't remember her last name for the life of me. She doesn't share the last name as her dad. Regardless, be careful out there in who you meet. You never know who they are behind the curtain. This happened seven and a half years ago on July 23rd, 2016. 
While I was cleaning out my house, I was renting a house for a year, and the year was almost up. I wasn't going to be living there the next year, so it was time for me to start cleaning out and moving my stuff to my next place. The house that I had at the time was fairly small, but it was plenty of space for just me. I lived there by myself, and I had just finished cleaning out the living room, other than some basic furniture, and I had moved on to clean the kitchen. There were quite a few cabinets, so many that I didn't use a good number of them. I was looking through some of the ones that I didn't use to make sure that there was nothing I had in them. One of them I opened up and I saw something in the back corner. It looked like some sort of shirt or rag. I grabbed it and saw that I didn't think it was mine. But when I moved it, it revealed a small white lever that I could barely see. The cabinet was in the corner sorted by the sink and halfway blocked by the stove. I thought it was just another pipe, but it just looked a little different to me. I got inside and had to crawl inside the cabinet, which was pretty large. Once I got inside, I saw that there was a small trap door to the side, leading into the wall. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. You had to be completely inside in order to see the detail of it. And I decided to open the door, which led to an extremely narrow hallway with a sort of a crawl space. But then I get further inside. I was horrified. I saw that there was food as well as several blankets, as if someone had been living inside of there. The good news, at least to me, is that whoever was in there was gone. I tried to make sense of it and figure out how long the person had been there and how I didn't know about it. I was gone from the house a lot with work and other stuff, but I didn't know how it was possible for someone to live in there without me knowing. I continued cleaning until it got pretty late, and the next day after work, I continued. I was still kind of shook with finding a secret room in my house and decided to look at it once again. I opened the cabinet and went inside. Then I pulled the lever open, just like I had the previous day. But this time, as soon as I opened it, I saw a movement, and then saw a person, for a split second. They slammed the door back shut on me, and I immediately turned and ran all the way out of my house to my car, and then called the police. I was so scared that I started driving away as well. I opened up my phone and told the police the whole situation, and they came to my house a short time later to find that whoever had been there was now gone. I was absolutely disgusted knowing this. This random person had access to my house for who knows how long. It felt like a vivid dream I needed to wake up from. When I opened up my phone to call the police, it showed that the date was June 23, 2016. I still remember this date, even seven years later. It stayed with me, like a scar. A scar I don't know if I will ever heal from. Luckily for me, I moved out the next week. I really didn't know how long the person was living in my secret room, but thankfully... It never gave me a problem. This happened about 10 years ago, give or take a year. My friend Craig and I made plans to go out with our friend Jeremy and his new girlfriend. Neither of us had to work the next day, so we grabbed some beers and made our way to Jeremy's mom's apartment complex, where Jer was temporarily staying. When we got there, we went out into the woods behind the apartment complex to drink. This wasn't just a little patch of trees, but a good-sized patch of forest. For context, this was in New York State. It was a nice fall day late afternoon, and the sun was still out. We finished the beers and decided to go get more, 
so we go to the store and get some more beer. Head back to the apartment and enter the woods. This was autumn, and the light outside was right at that stage where it starts to very quickly fade. We underestimated how dark it would be once we were in the woods and how fast the light was fading away. We planned on making a fire but didn't really count on it being so dark when we got back. So we're walking into this sort of clearing area from where we can choose to head off in a few different directions. We're having a good time, laughing, talking, but something not too far in the distance catches my eye. It's too dark to tell, but I swear I can see a very large figure. No, that's too big. It's probably a tree or just her eyes fucking with you. So, as Jerry is gabbing in the backyard, I ask Craig, as in aside, if he can see something standing up ahead. And he's like, nah, where? Oh, wait, there. Oh, oh, oh shit. We were still walking, and it was becoming clear I was not seeing things. There was a very large person standing in the woods up ahead, apparently facing us. So I tried to get Jeremy's attention without cluing the big guy in that we've noticed him. Just in case something sketchy is going on, which I get the serious feeling there is. We tell Jeremy there's a person up ahead, but Jeremy is in a jovial, chill state, and he exclaims, Holy shit, is that big fudge? We humor him and laugh, but it's clear to Craig and I that this is actually creepy and probably not a safe situation. And it's clear that Jeremy is completely not understanding that. It's hard to communicate the pacing of our approach onto the guy. But essentially, we had gotten too close not to acknowledge him. Partially because it took us a moment to get Jeremy's attention. And partially because we weren't trying to just turn around and run like we were scared. There was four of us and one of him, after all. But this was a big guy. Not supernaturally big or anything, and not like he was jacked or anything like that. Just a natural, gigantic dude. Very tall and heavy without being particularly fat. And he was just standing there in the middle of the forest, in the dark, alone. So as we approach this guy and just sort of say hello, Jeremy the absolute fool that he is, gets way too close into the guy's personal space as he enthusiastically tells him about how scary he looks standing in the woods alone. <laughs> we thought you were an alien or something, bro. <laughs> I thought you were going to jump us and... Blah. Jeremy mimes an extra set of teeth coming out of his mouth like a xenomorph from the movie Alien vs. Predator right up in this guy's face. To be clear, Jeremy is not trying to be intimidating or a jerk in any way. He is trying to be friendly and joking around with this guy, but he is literally leaning into this dude and practically sticking his hands in his face with his impression of an alien. Did I mention Jeremy was kind of a moron? Jeremy was kind of a moron. Love you, Jeremy. You were kind of a moron. And Jeremy's poor girlfriend, who was a few years younger than us and very shy, was clearly terrified, to which Jer was also oblivious. So Craig and I are both standing here, kind of trying to brainstorm a way out of the situation. Jeremy is clearly too dense to get it. If we say that we have to go, he'd be like, What? We just got here. Aren't we having a fire? And we were trying to seem confident and in control of the situation. The big guy says, Oh, you guys are drinking. I got some drinks too. And he walks over to the tree line where he has a bag laying beside a tree. He reaches in the bag, and while he grabs a beer with one hand, he sort of sneakily pulls something else out with his other hand and places it in his hoodie pocket. 
I'm convinced it was a knife or a gun, probably a knife in all honesty. He then reapproaches us and cracks open his beer. I glance around casually, and then I notice something else. Somebody else is out here. There's someone moving along the tree line to our left, a relatively good distance away, but somebody else is here, and they're circling around as if to come up behind us. Fuck this. I need to leave. Now. So I go, <laughs> well, I gotta work in the morning and Craig's driving me home, so we gotta get out of here. Jeremy, in his infinite wisdom, responds, What? You said you didn't have to work tomorrow. I facepalm so hard on the inside. <laughs> uh, no, Jeremy, you must have misheard me. I said I do have to work tomorrow. And Jeremy, proving there is no end to his wisdom, says, All right, guys, well, it was nice hanging out with you. Get home safe. He wasn't leaving the woods with us. Craig and I start walking away, and I told him about the other person circling to get behind us, and that we needed to move. We start trying to brainstorm a way to get Jeremy and his girlfriend out of there, and decided to call him and tell him that his mom was out in the parking lot looking for him. Jeremy is terrified of his mother. Craig explains to me, and this should work, because we clearly couldn't just call him and tell him the situation was not safe without him blurting out, This guy isn't sketchy. I feel totally safe. Jeremy was very mad at us for lying about his mom. I think his girlfriend appreciated it, though. I'm not sure what was going on there that night. I've talked to several people about it over the years, and there are a few different ideas. Did they know we were coming back? Were they waiting for us? Or did we stumble into something we weren't meant to? Almost everyone that I tell about this says, you guys just accidentally interrupted a drug deal. But something about that just didn't seem right. Who does a drug deal in the middle of the woods at night? I don't know. Very possibly just a homeless dude with no ill intention and another homeless dude with no ill intention. But it was a very creepy and scary situation, and I just thought I would share it with you. I recently met a female colleague 10 days back. Within just meeting, she started considering me as a best friend. Slowly, I started noticing very strange behavior in her. She started inquiring in detail about me to the point it felt abnormal to me. I am mostly a private person, so I rarely share much about myself, especially strangers, because my default mode is not to trust people initially. The more I try to avoid her questions, the more she is persistent with her same questions. She is asking me daily for my daily routine and which places I go. Once I mention that I go to the gym daily at a particular time and place, and she started coming to that place and letting me know subtly she is stalking me. She even asked Insta ID and started asking questions related to my Insta activities in detail, which means she is stalking me online as well. She gives me a vibe of a psychopath, and my gut feeling tells me something is wrong with her psychologically. Or it could be I am paranoid and overthinking into it. I'm not sharing with my friends and family due to fear of judgment. I have heard that stalkers are dangerous and unpredictable, in some cases resulting in violent crime. So, I am afraid of this woman and what her intentions are. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true creepy encounters. 
I would like to take this moment and thank the reform members of Back to Ashes. Tina Mead, Colt Stone Wolf, Mrs. Innerscare, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, CAG, Denise Dess, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norma DW, Chrissy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. Thank you all for your love and support. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.